Welcome to Student Hours. Joining me today is Dr. Nathaniel Morris. How are you doing today? All good. Thank you for having me on the show. Yeah, the show was a pleasure to be here and thank you very much for being my next guest. To start, I always like to go back to the beginning. So what began your interest in history? Um, I was always interested in the past, I guess. Um, stories about family history. Um, and I think when I was about eight or nine, as kids do, I just got randomly obsessed by the Celts. Um, and yeah, since then, I've kind of been interested in, um, yeah, the history of underdog peoples, really. Mm. Um, yeah, the Tudors were never really it, but um, the kind of slightly like less obvious histories that we weren't taught about. Um, it's kind of it's always been fascinating to me. That's interesting, and you've, you've definitely touched on something there with regards to how history is kind of has generally historically been taught in this country, focusing a lot usually on the school level at the Tudors, World War Two, World War One, which obviously has its place. Um, how do you describe your upbringing in terms of how you were taught history? Would you say it was relatively similar to that general trope of um, you know Tudors, etc., etc.? Were you interested in it at school? Do you think, or was it much more your own interested studies that got you interested more? Um... I can't even really remember uh, <laughs> primary school history teaching beyond, you know, the Victorians um, and probably, uh, you know, a kind of load of kings and, and queens, whether they were Tudors. I mean, Henry VIII was in there. There were probably some Stuarts. Um, we might have done a bit of like life in the trenches. I think things diversified for me a bit at secondary school, um, at least when we kind of got to GCSE level, and then there was a little bit more liberty within the national curriculum um, to kind of, yeah, explore things beyond world wars, British, and mainly English, really, kings mm. and queens. Um, so, yeah, I just, I had the very good luck of having a very passionate um, and extremely smart and kind of like well-versed in history, uh, history teacher. R.I.P. Miss Louisu, um, who was, yeah, like she was a history graduate. She was like really interested in history. She was terrifying, so nobody like messed about in class. Um, but she was also kind of really enthusiastic about the subject. And yeah, we ended up doing Peter the Great, um, and the kind of birth of modern Russia. We did. Um, Gustavus Adolphus and the kind of short-lived Swedish empire, which mm. nobody knew was a thing until no. we started doing that with her. Um, and then we had the opportunity to write our own kind of dissertations, um, I think for A-level, where she really encouraged us to just kind of find something we were interested in, research it and mm. write about it. And I ended up um, writing about the Spanish Civil War, which I'd never studied before, but I was kind of able to teach myself about. And um, yeah, I think that was what convinced me that history at university um, was something that was going to suit me. Hmm. Interesting. And what do you think makes a good teacher? What are the, you touched on obviously your teachers, their uh, enthusiasm and passion for the subject. What else do you think makes a really good teacher? You can be as enthusiastic as you like, but unless you can control a classroom, um, <laughs> there's kind of no point. We had all sorts of enthusiastic teachers who got absolutely rinsed. Miss oh. um, Louisu was a really good combination of like strict, but not in a way that was alienating. Um, we kind of knew that like if we took the piss, she was going to take the piss back. Um, she could really like cut you down to size, but kind of on like teenager terms right and everyone else in the class would be like "Ooh, miss got you there and you know so like she was kind of able to engage on our level and win right. um whereas not for everybody there are a few unlucky people so to speak who didn't have the same effect yeah pretty much so i mean i think you need to you need to be passionate mm. you need to be able to kind of represent your subject and make it seem like something that is worthy of 
interest leading by example. But I think you also need pretty good kind of interpersonal skills um, in order to kind of make the classroom yours. Hmm. Um, and some people have lots of one but lack the other, you know, in both directions. We had all sorts of teachers who were really strict disciplinarians. Everyone hated their classes because they were no fun. Hmm. Um, and there was kind of no passion for the subject that, that really came across. All you got was kind of the fear. Um, so yeah, I think it's really difficult, to be honest. Um, uh, at least at university, you know, students are kind of paying to be there. Mm. So um, yeah, for us kind of lecturers, um, there are far less kind of really intense issues of, of discipline and trying to kind of keep a lid on like the chaotic energy. If anything, we struggle with getting people to really speak out and kind of express themselves for fear of what the rest of the group is doing or, I don't know, I guess people are also just hung over. Yeah, um, <laughs> well, no, 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 this is just... No. Definitely not. How much of that do you think, in terms of what makes a good teacher, again, just, I think it's an interesting subject, how much of that do you think is just natural, that some people just naturally kind of have it, the, the balance between maintaining discipline but being engaging, and how much of it can be taught, do you think, from your experience? God, I don't know. I mean, I've never done a PGCE or really gained any sort of teaching qualification. So I'm just making it up as I go along. And I think <laughs> I do an all right job. Um, I'm sure that I would benefit from a bit more kind of taught theory. But then I don't know how good a student I am. So, um, yeah, I think it depends on, on your level as well. You can kind of get away with a lot um, in a classroom of like seven-year-olds um, mm. in a way that you can't with 15 year old you make you know, one step wrong and they've got you it's so you know? weird isn't it? it's almost instantly that age can just sense like either weakness or I mean we've all got stories of teachers <laughs> like that who are sometimes themselves kind of fresh out of university and you know doing it for uh, to get the qualifications and um, you know we've all got stories about just these it's like a sheep to the slaughter they're sent in sometimes. Mm -hmm. No, instantly, if they don't have the confidence. It's weird, though. There's like a sense that like, that age group sort of has instantly. Yeah. That sort of pack mentality, I suppose. Yeah, 100%. And, you know, no weakness permitted. Um, but, yeah, I think, you know, at, at university it's different. And I'm, I've never been in a science classroom at, at university, but I'm sure that every kind of discipline has its own dynamics as well, which... Sure, the skills that you need to kind of run a lab well some of them are going to be different to running a kind of seminar of history students who you're trying to get to like constructively debate ideas mm -hmm. together um we're trying to get away from just rote learning of facts if anything um which can probably be a shock to the system for some of the students absolutely I'm, i think we'll touch more on this later on but i'd like to go back to your interest in history and where they sort of came from. What began your interest in Latin America and just, you know, South America more broadly as an area of research for yourself? Um, random family connections, really. Um, so I have extended family in Mexico, um, who I'd never met growing up, but I knew about them because mm. they were the kind of like most interesting as far as I was concerned kind of part of my, I don't know, ancestry or whatever. I grew up in North London in a very multicultural area. Um, my school was very, very kind of mixed. Um, and in fact, I was one of the few kids who was just like straight up UK, white, British, um, kind of the, the, the most out there bit of my ancestry is like my nana was Northern Irish, you know. But she was a Protestant Northern Irish person, so like, it's not even, she wasn't even Catholic, <laughs> you know. Um, and I, you know, hearing about where people had gone for the holidays, like people had gone to see family in Poland, in Spain, like in Italy, um, you know, they'd gone up to see family in the north of Scotland, you know. Everyone had these kind of, to me, really interesting kind of like 
diverse family backgrounds. Um, and at a certain point, I think I really seized on um, the fact that I had an uncle, my dad's half-brother, who went off to Mexico, um, stayed there, got married, had a load of kids. Um, and so, although I never got to claim that I was part Mexican, I did have family in Mexico. Right. Anyway, I mean, I'd always been really interested um, in kind of meeting them and the fact that they were out there, I think, um, just had me interested from a fairly early age in, in Mexico in particular. Mm -hmm. um, add into the mix being uh, a, a pretty left-wing kind of, well, kid really. Um, <laughs> from the earliest times um, and all the way through kind of teenagehood. Um, and, you know, Latin America was somewhere where revolutions had happened mm. and revolutions indeed were happening. Um, you know, the Zapatistas were, they had an uprising and were constructing a new reality um, in the jungles of southern Mexico. And that was an ongoing thing. Evo Morales was like becoming the first ever indigenous president in Bolivia and trying to kind of reshape society. And he was up there at the UN kind of chewing coca leaves. Uh, All of this. They, what they said in the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he, he, he brought some coca leaves in um, to the UN with his diplomatic immunity um, and chewed them on stage in order to demonstrate that coca is not some kind of evil hmm. drug. Um, it is a, a ritual good and a mild, very mild stimulant um, that has been unfairly kind of persecuted um, by, you know, the West, which have imposed their vision of this um, onto the rest of the world. Uh, and as the kind of head of the coca growers union turned kind of social movement leader turned first indigenous president of Bolivia, he viewed it as one of his jobs um, to go and tell the truth to the world on literally the world stage, um, you know, right up there in front of the UN. Um, which kind of, you know, meanwhile at home, we're just, you know, invading Iraq the um, sort of stuff. and, uh, you know, privatizing the NHS and whatever else. And So Latin America was like, wow, okay, there's stuff that's really interesting mm. going on there. And I want to go and like learn about that and live some of that. So as soon as I got a chance, um, you know, left school, worked my ass off for about seven months, saved up as much money as I possibly could, and then went to Latin America for eight months. Wow. Started in Cuba, um, traveled through Mexico, Central America, down to Colombia, and then kind of came out of Venezuela. Um, and yeah, by the end of that, um, I had learned half decent Spanish. Um, I had amassed a load of like really to me, kind of amazing experiences um, with indigenous people, with like small farmers, with soldiers, with, you know, all sorts of things that kind of blew my mind. Um, and then, yeah, went off to do my undergraduate degree in ancient and modern history um, at Oxford. And... Um, yeah, chose all of the most ancient of the ancient history modules and all of the most modern of the modern history modules with as much Latin America um, as I could possibly, possibly do. Um, and yeah, that kind of like set in train a series of events that have ended with me sitting here talking to you on this podcast. There we go, full circle. <laughs> <laughs> Would you mind if we break down your trip through Latin America a bit more? Because it does sound really interesting and obviously quite a formative experience on your life I'm guessing yeah um sure. would you mind could we start with Cuba please just out of interest what was that experience like going to Cuba and what what did you sort of get up to over there and so I spent a month in Cuba um Fidel Castro was still in power hmm. a couple of months after I left Cuba um he fell ill and left power which I had nothing to do with um, <laughs> <Officially>. <laughs> this one, I was really there kind of you know at the you know 
the last gasp of like Fidelista hmm. Cuba. Um, oh, sorry, what was that like? The, the, the atmosphere at the time when you were there? It was... I mean, it was kind of really interesting. Yeah, and <laughs> um, my Spanish was pretty rudimentary at that point. So, you know, there were serious limitations on how much I really understood. But um, I drank a lot of rum um, with like local people. Uh, I, you know, I had very little money. Um, so I wasn't able to kind of take part in the, at this point in Cuba, um, there were two different currencies. There's tourist currency, which is pegged directly to the dollar, and there are pesos cubanos, which are like worth a fraction of that. And you can spend these different kind of currencies in different places. The tourist money you spend in tourist places and you buy tourist stuff for tourist prices. And it's kind of the luxury economy, mm. um, which most Cubans didn't have access to. Only those who were able to somehow get hold of this tourist money through basically working in the tourist industry, um, which created this weird world of like taxi drivers in Havana who were like getting paid by tourists in tourist money, kind of able to then buy themselves luxury goods that doctors hmm. um, and teachers um, had absolutely no way of kind of getting hold of. And so there was this this weird thing where sort of, yeah, suddenly there were these slightly weird and often quite contradictory class divisions emerging in a society that was supposedly classless. So that was an interesting dynamic that, um, yeah, that I mean, I probably didn't interrogate all that much, mainly because I had no tourist money. I changed all of my money into like, Cuban money, um, and then proceeded to spend it in the places that normal Cubans were spending it. Um, on street pizzas and the like Cuban beer rather than the tourist beer. Mm. Um, and yeah, taking buses and trains um, rather than taxis and tourist buses, you know. Um, which was great, really, because I kind of saw a side to Cuba, um, as far as is ever possible as an outsider in Cuba, where things are kind of much more tightly controlled, say, than in Mexico. Um, but yeah, so I went to, spent a while in Havana, and went down to Camagüey, which is not a particularly touristy place. Um, Were there any kind of overt differences that you noticed because of that, because it wasn't as touristy in terms of, I don't know, maybe anything that happened differently? Well, I mean, for a start, there are far fewer tourists Right. Um, and far fewer kind of places geared towards tourists. Mm. Uh, so it all just felt way more like what I'd always kind of imagined Cuba would be like, as opposed to some of the glitzy bits of Havana, where mm. I was a bit like, but this isn't revolutionary Cuba. What? <laughs> um, but it was kind of pretty informative, I guess, as a first brush with a supposedly revolutionary society and actually seeing the reality of that, which is that, Okay, there's a fair bit of revolution going on, but there's also a load of rather less revolutionary stuff going on. You know, there are a lot of contradictions here. Um, why? How? How does it all work? Um, which I think has been pretty useful uh, in terms of understanding how stuff really is in the world. Um, I only wish that some of the people with loud opinions on the internet could go and actually experience some real stuff. Um, I think there's this tendency now to really invest in, in a belief that everything is completely black and white mm. and you're either like one thing or the other without understanding that it's not, it's not that simple. Life can never Absolutely. be that simple. Everything is interconnected. Everything is really bloody complicated. And, um, yeah, you know, like US foreign policy is often abhorrent. That doesn't mean that Russian foreign policy is good. You no, know, exactly. like but it's all about fitting it into the headline, isn't it? And mm. and um and, and it's all it's all about picking sides as well. It's all about which side are you on and it, it's it's about a lot in the mainstream narrative as well. It's just about whose side are you on, like you said, is it a black and white narrative? Is it yes or no? Is this good or bad? And the reality is always more complicated than that. Even in things that seem, you know, just outwardly bad, there's more going on there. There's there's more perspective to see. Mm. 
And as you've explained in the case of Cuba, could you maybe explain that a little bit more, what, what you mean when you, you see the reality of the way things work, if that makes sense? Like what things, that may have even surprised you, that, that questioned your own, as you said, your view of what a, a revolutionary Cuba looked like. What was the reality when you saw it? Um, an extremely well-educated population, even people who were kind of, from the way that they looked and where they were living were extremely kind of materially poor, um, had a really high level of education. They knew about history and geography and everyone could kind of place England in the world and had so many conversations about international politics, about the war in Iraq. Um, what were their sort of views? Sorry, sorry to keep interrupting, just because. But what were their views on that? Or what was going on in, in the West? And the... Well, I mean, for the most part, people were pretty anti the war in Iraq, for example, because is you know they, they have a very good education. Their education is a fairly revolutionary education, and this was a. You don't have to be a revolutionary, I think, to see it as a pretty clear cut example of um, kind of yeah a mix of deluded do-gooderism and just plain extractive imperialism. Um, so people saw that for what it was. Um, lots of, yeah, lots of conversations about what what George Bush was up to and whether he was really stupid or whether he was kind of putting on an act in order to like get away with stuff that he wouldn't otherwise. Um, so on the one hand, you know, people were really well educated. Um, and lots and lots of really old people as well. You know, you could see that life expectancy um, was kind of amazing because there were all these pretty ancient people in fairly good health, kind of, you know, on the streets, in the cafes. Um, and clearly there was enough kind of disposable income um, that people might be materially poor, but people were also kind of able to drink a beer you know, rather than that becoming a kind of life or death luxury. I mean, I think in part that's because there were literally, or were at that time, kind of beer and and cigarettes on your kind of ration books. Um, on the other hand, though, um, there, were, there was lots of kind of hustle. Um, people would see you're a tourist, and I, I really got the feeling in Havana especially, that um, everyone was out to try and extract something from me, which I was kind of conflicted about. Because on the one hand, I was like, fair enough, actually. Like, <laughs> I'm completely fair game. Mm. Um, <laughs> I kind of like, this is completely legitimate. People should be trying to, like, yeah. um, get what they can out of me. Like, because in many ways, I am kind of like a cash machine with a flashing dollar sign above my head. On the other hand, um, this is really annoying um, because I, I might look legitimately like I have money that I should be dishing out, but actually I also don't mm. and uh, this is really awkward and people are trying to get stuff from me that I can't actually give to them and there is always a kind of like ulterior motive for mm. so many of these interactions. Getting out of Havana to less touristy places, there was a lot less of that kind of relational interaction where people would be nice to me but only in the expectation that they were then going to get something at the end of it. There was a lot more genuine interactions where people were interested to know like you know what the hell are you doing here? What's your story? Right. Okay well that's really I've never really like sat down with uh, someone from London before so like tell me about it and you know, we'd have these interesting conversations. Similarly you know there were kind of Realising that um, the health system um, was much better than kind of anywhere else in Latin America, at least for poor people. But at the same time, you were aware that um, there was a shortage of medicines because of the blockade. Um, and the fact that the kind of, you know, this amazing revolutionary state wasn't able to overcome that made you slightly think like, one, okay, are the Yankee imperialists therefore kind of winning? And two, oh, well, if it was, really was the perfect society, wouldn't they have found a way to like make their own aspirin, whatever? Mm. 
Um, and then in Santiago, I remember just sort of the other side of the island from Havana and kind of the capital really of like black Cuba. It's like Afro-Cuban heartland. Um, supposedly this kind of classless society where racism has ceased to be a thing. Um, having a conversation in a kind of town square um, with a Rasta guy um, who was in fact talking to me slightly in a slightly roundabout way about um, the fact that representatives of authority, the police, um, view Rastafarianism as something that is potentially kind of dangerous or unsavory in some way. You know, there's a suspicion of religion. Um, there's a suspicion of stuff from outside of Cuba. You know, Rastafarianism tied to like Jamaica. Um, and I guess just like there is a, a huge amount of prejudice towards like and suspicion of any kind of suggestion of, of drugs, including marijuana. And as this guy was kind of telling me, oh yeah, but you know, we get kind of like stopped and searched way too often by the police and like it's quite hard being like Rastafarian here and like we are law abiding citizens, but like we're treated as, um, and a police guy kind of strolled over and literally like moved the guy on because the assumption was he was kind of hassling me and trying to like get something out of me. And I was like, no, no, no we're having a really nice conversation. And the guy was like, you know, the policeman is like, no, 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 and I didn't understand what was going on. And then it's like, you know, my Rasta pal of 10 minutes was just like, it, it's better that I go, let's not make a fuss. I was a bit like, uh-huh, okay. So, um, yeah, like race is definitely still a thing. Sure, mm -hmm. maybe like it's not as much of a thing as it would have been pre-Castro, but like there is clearly discrimination that exists here. Um, so yeah, you know, th there were there were lots of kind of ups and downs. And then going to other places in Latin America, um, I think gave me lots of context to kind of like critically reflect on that. Sure, okay, so there's definitely still anti-black racism and particularly kind of discrimination against Rastafarians in, in Cuba. I mean, that kind of discrimination has got nothing on the forms of racism that exist in Mexico um, or pretty much anywhere else in, in Latin America um, uh, that I went to, as far as I could see. Um, you know, Afro-Colombians were getting attacked by right-wing paramilitaries supported by the government you know, when I was in Colombia. Um, indigenous people were kind of being attacked by state forces um, and were also victims of just like kind of generalized societal racism, just like to a next degree in Mexico. Um, and yeah, you know, class has not ceased to exist in Cuba. Um, but the kind of implications of belonging to a lower class for your life expectancy are still way less extreme than again in say Mexico, where mm. if you're poor, you were definitely gonna die younger than someone who is like better off, you know, unless you're really, really lucky. Like the odds are just way more stacked. So again, useful in terms of like learning how to to think in terms of comparisons, to think a bit like comparatively and reflect on one thing in the context of another thing, um, rather than just being like, okay, if X, Y, and Z still exist in Cuba, Cuba is a terrible place. Like, no, there are some real problems with mm. Cuban society um, that despite revolutionary propaganda have clearly not gone away. That means that, well, one, revolutionary propaganda is kind of to an extent full of shit. Two, um, it's really hard to kind of like legislate your way out of a load of problems. Um, three, yeah, this stuff exists. That doesn't mean that Cuba is hell because it's worse 
you know, a stone's throw away like across the Caribbean where um, a lot of the same problems exist, but are kind of that much more extreme. Um, and yet there's no blockade of Mexico. Mm. Um, you know, on kind of spurious human rights grounds. So yeah. And as you're, as you're going for your travels, are you, um, at the time, are you documenting this as well? Are you sort of recording any interviews or conversations you're having, taking photographs, that type of thing? Uh, yeah, I was taking photographs and keeping a, keeping a diary. Cool. Um, so yeah, kind of collecting knickknacks as well. Um, so yeah, fair amount of, of that's kind of recorded one way or another. Is there, I don't suppose any of them are available for people to see, are they, are they sort of your personal sort of documents, if you know what I mean? Uh, available for people to see. As in on like a website or something, if, you, like if you've uploaded any of them? No, no. Um, no, no, none of that is kind of, no. There's a lot of stuff on my walls. Um, yeah, from, there's a lot of stuff behind me. various yeah. trips, but none of those are actually from my, uh, from my very first kind of formative trip to the Americas. Interesting. And that, that brings on to Mexico, though, mate. So then when you, went to, when you visited Mexico, so what was that like? And is that where you then visited your family as well? Or is, yeah. Brilliant. Can we talk about that, what that experience was like? And, uh, yeah, what, what did you get up to in Mexico? So, yeah, so I spent, must have been like three and a half, four months in Mexico. It was the longest kind of stint that I spent in any one country, um, which I figured was kind of only fair given the size of Mexico. Um, it was the biggest country I went to, so I spent the most time there. Um, so yeah, I flew from Cuba across to the Yucatan Peninsula, to Cancun. Um, kicked around on the kind of Caribbean coast for a bit, just doing touristy stuff. Then happened to be spring break, so I went <laughs> the kind of ethnologist's participant observation uh, kind of agenda. Um, and did two days of spring break, and then I was like... What was that like, sorry, spring break? I mean, it was just lots and lots of drunk Americans, <laughs> wet t-shirt competitions, frat boys, um, you know, horrible fun, <laughs> I guess. Um, yeah, I wasn't able to participate fully because I didn't have that much money, so I was kind of watching a lot of this stuff from the sidelines um but yeah i mean it was um it was i guess an insight into um kind of mass tourism in mexico it was also the last time i did anything in any way mass touristy in mexico um so yeah then i went and checked out lots and lots of mayan ruins um swam in cenotes um ate a lot of delicious food and then, and then I heard that Manu Chao was playing a free gig in the Zocalo, which is the central kind of square of Mexico City, um, in a couple of days. I think it was like, oh yeah, like the day after tomorrow, Manu Chao was playing a massive free concert in like, in the Zocalo of Mexico City. So um, yeah, I jumped on a bus and spent, I think it was like a 20 hour bus. Um, across the country to get to Mexico City in time to then hit up this massive free gig, which was kind of like a mini festival in the middle of um, Mexico City. So it's, um, yeah, it's the biggest kind of public square in the world, in the middle of one of the biggest cities in the world. You know, the scale of just the whole lot was kind of mind-blowing. Um so yeah, had a great time at that gig and staying in a hostel in Mexico City, drank a lot, you know, partied, had fun. And then um, from there, I guess, what did I do from there? I, I can't really exact order that things happened in, but I went up to the deserts um, of San Luis Potosí. Mm near a place called Real de Catorce. Um, which is a kind of back 
at that point anyway, it was this kind of ghost town, former mining, colonial mining center that had kind of fallen on hard times. These days, it's, it's kind of re-emerged as a tourism hub. Um, there wasn't really very much of that when I was there, which was a bloody long time ago now. Um, it's where the Virarica, or Wichol people, um, who I now work with, um, but I didn't really know much about them at this point, um, it's where they go on their pilgrimages to harvest the peyote cactus. Um, so yeah, I went and indulged in a form of tourism that nowadays I'm kind of quite against. Um, but yeah, I, I went out to the desert and found a guy to like show me around and um, I ate a load of peyote and tripped out in the desert and had sort of amazing psychedelic experiences. I now oh. know that this is irresponsible and um, <laughs> potentially like literally taking this sacred cactus out of circulation for the, the Viraditari who need it for their whole kind of religious life. Um, but, you know, as a 19 year old, um, I didn't know any of that. Um, what was that like, the psychedelic experiences? Could you talk about that? Um, yeah, I mean, um, I sat in the desert um, tripping on mescaline and had a lot of thoughts about life, <laughs> enjoyed, enjoyed the colours, um, and... Um, yeah, I guess finally understood what all of those like beat and hippie kind of counterculture writers that I'd kind of read as a teenager were on about when it came to like that side of Mexico and indeed that side of of, of kind of things in general. Um, so yeah, you know, I guess like again, more kind of formative experiences. Mm. Um, yeah. I hung out in Michoacan as well, which is now um, a pretty like conflictive zone of Mexico. Um, at that point, you know, this was before um, the kind of modern war on the cartels had been declared. Um, so yeah, it was um, it was a very different Mexico. There was you know, all sorts of cartel activity and drug trafficking and stuff going on, but there wasn't kind of like generalized, widespread, drug-related or cartel-related kind of conflict that there is now. So I guess it was, you know, I was a bit freer and easier in terms of my ability to travel and do whatever the hell I wanted. Um, so yeah, kicked around Michoacan. Um, I went up to Chihuahua um, and took... The Chepe train through the Copper Canyon, um, stopped off various points along the way, took a bus down into the Urique Canyon. Um, again, now a zone that is very much, well, it's quite, it's not necessarily advisable to do long cross country hikes in that part of the Sierra. And why is that? Nowadays. That's just the, the sort of the cartels that type of. Or... Yeah, there's there's um, there are like poppy plantations and weed plantations guarded by men with guns, and there are just lots of guns about, and potentially there are lots of uh, yeah suspicious people who might not take too kindly to someone kind of randomly appearing out of nowhere, kind of near their patch. Um, it's not to say that like will get killed if you go here right. um, but it's probably not something I would do now but back then the understanding was like you shouldn't walk from here to here and then go off in that direction because that way there are weed fields um, but sort of this way it's fine so yeah so I did a lot of like hiking in the, the mountains and the kind of the, the subtropical kind of valley floor um, in Urique uh, the Urique Canyon, which is amazing. Met lots of Bararamuri people, Tarahumara people. Um, 
who are the kind of indigenous group that live in that part of Mexico. Um, what is that experience like meeting indigenous peoples of that region? Yeah, I mean, you know, it wasn't, I didn't go and like live in their communities right. or anything. It was kind of, you know, but I meet people and kind of have a little chat with them. Um, I hung out with an after, of an afternoon with um, a little Draramuri kid, um, like who was just kind of hanging out where I happened to be walking and uh, I still didn't speak that much Spanish. He didn't speak that much Spanish. So we kind of like, I shared some of my food with him. Um, uh, we had a stone throwing competition <laughs> off the side of a mountain. Um, I had some kind of rudimentary small talk. You know, those sorts of experiences right, okay. where you, I don't think you come away with some great transcendental kind of like knowledge about very much, but you're interacting with people that you've never interacted with before and yeah, engaging with a different community, different communities, yeah. people who are kind of inherently like represent some sort of other with a capital O mm. um, in a way that is always probably more, it's probably more important for one in terms, yeah, it probably teaches you more about yourself than it does give you any like deep knowledge of the other. Um, but yeah, by, by seeing other people who live completely different to you, um, yeah, I think you kind of are forced to reflect a bit on how it is that you do live hmm. um, in a way that is always valuable. Um, I think seeing some of the really grinding, like just the levels of poverty, right. material poverty, um, is also really instructive because like, Jesus, we're privileged here in so many ways that like, we don't stop and think about, um, or at least like as a middle-class white kid in North London, like I certainly was, um, I think just, yeah, you know, people who face the genuine threat of starvation during certain months of the year and kind of literally freezing to death at other points of the year. Well, maybe that's all becoming a bit more familiar to Brits at the moment. Um, what with the food banks and the cost of living and the fact that, uh, you know, um, people can't afford to heat their houses and the number of homeless people on the streets has kind of gone up by a factor of about 100 since I was off doing my travels. So yeah, maybe all of this shit is way more real to us now. Um, but this was kind of pre-economic crash. Um, and yeah, I guess it was, it was important for like slightly wrenching me out of um, certain assumptions. Um, obviously I had, as a kind of left-wing revolutionary teenager, I knew that grinding poverty existed and wanted the world to be more equal, but until you really like see it, it can be hard to truly understand it. Mm. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah. And then I headed down, um, to my Mexican family, um, in the kind of Northwestern state of Nayarit, um, hung out with them for a month. Um, my Spanish came along leaps and bounds. Um, with them um, because yeah of my five cousins one speaks perfect English or at that time spoke perfect English two of them kind of spoke mm, more or less um, and two of them very much did, understood but didn't actually speak English these are half English half Mexican people um, and none of their mates who I was hanging out with as well kind of spoke English so um, yeah, really pushed me to like develop my growing Spanish, it exposed me to a whole load of um, useful kind of countryside vocabulary and mm. yeah, and I did things that I'd never done before like um, go off in the back of a pickup truck 
during a thunderstorm to like chop down a tree to like build a stand um, for the new TV that my cousin had bought for his bar because the World Cup was about to start. Right. And, um, you know, and that was kind of what you do. Right. There was no like going to a shop and buying a TV stand. It's like you need to make one. Um, and you make one by going and like chopping down a particular kind of tropical hardwood tree that will withstand the inevitable termite attacks that you would, you know, get because it was the rainy season. So, yeah. Um, and then, uh, yeah, left them, headed further south. Um, arrived in Oaxaca just as um, a very important moment in Oaxacan history kicked off. Um, so yeah, basically the um, the town rose up in well rose up, um, kicked out the authorities, the police, and the military, and the the local politicians um, declared themselves an autonomous zone in a state of kind of general strike. Right. And um, yeah, started off with a teacher's strike that was then like violently repressed, um, I think by the state police. And in response, the kind of the whole city just rose up and kicked them all out. Um, so yeah, was there in Oaxaca for a week at the very beginning of this kind of local like? rebellion. Um, yeah, I mean, it was random as hell that I just happened to, <laughs> having always been interested in Latin America, revolutions, Maybe left-wing revolution. politics. Um, yeah, just, okay, it's happening. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so what's going on? So what's, I, just, could you please, like, describe the scenes? What are you seeing? What What's going on? Are you able to just sort of keep your distance or? Well, so I just, just met up with a mate from home, um, had flown out to Mexico and we were going to do some traveling together. Um, he came out to meet me in Nayarit during my kind of last couple of days there. We had a nice time. Um, then he was bitten by a spider and I was stung by a scorpion. <laughs> so we were both in ver uh, ver in various states of like <laughs> sort of severe pain and like mild hallucinations. But we decided I probably forced him um, to get on a bus anyway to travel across Mexico. Um, to Oaxaca. Um, so at about, I think, midnight, we get off the bus, a bit confused because the bus station's empty. There are no taxis um, anywhere to be found. So we kind of walk out in the direction of like the center of town, manage to hail a cab on the road. Cab driver's like, oh yeah, you know, like, I was like, how are things? So, you know, like there's a little problem with the teachers right now, but like, yeah, you know, nothing too unusual. He drops us off um, where we thought this hostel was um, and sort of zooms off in the opposite direction. There's broken glass oh my everywhere God. and kind of bits of like two by four kind of wooden planks which I guess were from people's placards um, and yeah we kind of hammer on the door of this hostel there's no answer you know I think we eventually spent probably about 40 minutes just banging on the door until finally the hostel owner comes down it's like we're fucking closed <laughs> like, there's a revolution on there's been tear gas everyone we're like you have to let us in man um, so <laughs> eventually relents and lets us in he's like oh, but only you know you're you're That's gone it. tomorrow right. like i'm really annoyed with you um so we stayed there a week it was fine <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah i mean it was um it was really interesting there were barricades you know then the light of day tomorrow we go off for a walk there are barricades everywhere um guarded by mainly men wearing kind of scarves and bandanas and hats, um, holding iron bars, seemed to me to be you know, the kind of bars that you use for reinforcing concrete. Hmm. Um, so people have armed themselves with those and baseball bats, um, the odd machete. Um, and 
the streets are just kind of like full of people basically camped out. They've got like put up kind of awnings, tarps, ropes from kind of like house to house, like holding up these tarps to give shelter from the rain. Um, and yeah, a couple of times a day, there are meetings in the central square, which is also just this kind of hub of activity. And there are all of the different factions have got their like kind of camps um, and sort of tables with information. And there are kind of like flyer and pamphlet production lines going on. Um, and again, a couple of times a day, there are like you know, people come around in trucks with food, just kind of distributed to the, you know, the people and people are kind of taking shifts and the general kind of like demand is for um, Ulysses Ruiz, I believe, was the name of the state governor who had authorized or indeed ordered the kind of violent repression of this like teachers protest, um, which apparently happened every year. Teachers would protest for more resources. It's kind of just like a thing that happened and the government would say sure and then do nothing. It had almost just become like part of yeah, you know, it's a day in the calendar. Um, but this time round, for whatever reason, um, the state governor had kind of given the order to like yeah, kick the shit out of a load of these protesting yeah. teachers, which, you know, the rest of Oaxacan society didn't take too kindly to. Um, I'm sure there was, you know, there was all sorts of stuff going on and different kind of political factions had different aims um i'm sure some of it was just pure factionalism there were a load of like committed kind of activists in the mix as well and all the various different communist parties and pro zapatista factions and pro indigenous factions and slightly more like mainstream um pseudo social movements with kind of personalist tendencies are also in the mix. Um, but yeah, I mean, so I can't really speak to um, the overall kind of politics of the movement because as far as I was aware at the time, it was a real kind of mix. But what was really interesting was kind of the energy and the fact that essentially like town or this city had kind of declared itself an autonomous zone, had kicked out the kind of coercive forces of, of state authority um, and was managing to kind of like feed itself and mm. guard itself from further attack. And um, did you see any kind of further attempted attack or what else what, did you see? Not while I was there. I mean, we, we were there for about a week. After which, interesting as the revolution was, I mean, there were a million other things that I wanted to see of course. and time was running out. So we yeah, we kicked out. But um, no, later, weeks, maybe months later, um, there were kind of running battles in the streets as the state tried to take back over. Um, an American photojournalist um, was was killed. Bloody hell. Um, you know, caught in the crossfire of some sort. Um, a couple of other people were killed how many people actually died is uncertain and Ulysses Ruiz never stepped down as governor in fact he managed to like kind of get back into control of, of the place um yeah basically you know the the protests were eventually kind of repressed mm. um but while it lasted it was pretty interesting yeah because what's in the way you've described it as well and so far your travels in general and particularly in Mexico You've described it in a way that you've been able to kind of drift through and you've obviously explained that this would be when the, the violence going on with the drugs gangs was not as intense as it is now. And you've described it, as I said, you were able to kind of drift through, but were you ever in danger at all? Did you ever feel sort of in danger or did you have any sort of encounters that made you feel unsafe or anything like that? I mean, you've, you've gone through a, a rebellion coming through, but did you ever personally get kind of, you know, attacked or were worried of being attacked? Uh, no, no, I was, um, I was hit in the face with a brick in Cancun. What? Um, <laughs> How did that happen? I was, I was, I was, I was pickpocketed at about six o'clock in the morning coming back from, um, a club via, 
a kind of sandwich stall that just opened up in the municipal market. Um, you know, six o'clock in the morning in a municipal market in the kind of shady bit of, of Cancun where I was staying. Um, it was a place where an extremely drunken, like 19 year old foreigner, fair game. Um, anyway, I was, I was drunk enough though to then like, well, the pickpockets weren't that professional. Um, <laughs> so I completely like clocked that there's someone had just come by and like literally taken some money out of my pocket. Right. I was very, very drunk. I was very annoyed. Um, so I ran after them. Oh, God. Um, and we just sort of, I just ran after them like an, like an <laughs> idiot. And um, eventually um, kind of got close enough to them that I was trying to like grab one of them to like get the money back that they still one of them still had it in his hand because they were sort of racing away from me didn't really have time to stop and stick it in his pocket so at some point I think like I got hold of this money sort of wrestled this guy and the other one whacked me in the face with a breeze block um I kind of fell over yeah got my money back um but also was now kind of spurting blood um so then I got back up and chased after them, yelling all of my best Spanish swear words. Um, they must have been terrified at this point, to be honest. Um, they were definitely way more scared than I was because I must have seemed completely insane. Um, and some kind of well-meaning passerby, probably on their way to work, um, stopped the crazed gringo with the blood pouring out of his head. Um, and a Red Cross ambulance was materialised. Um, and... Yeah, um, they whacked a sponge soaked in disinfectant on my side of my face. And then, um, yeah, which is actually the worst bit of it because it went in my eye. <laughs> um, and that's what I really remember. I didn't know how to say it burns. All I, the closest I could get was picante, which means spicy. <laughs> um, yeah, I was a right idiot. Um, and yeah, and they gave me, I think I had four stitches. Um, but yeah, that was the only kind of physical harm um, that I came to uh, on my travels, um, which entirely self-inflicted, really. Um, again, good learning experience. Mm. Just let it go. <laughs> let it go, man. Um, yeah. No, I mean, I think... On the whole, um, I was probably too kind of enthusiastic and well-meaning for anyone to like actively want to like really do me much harm. I think, you know, it would have been like kind of beating a puppy. Um, <laughs> and I was, but I was also, you know, but beating a puppy, but in a, in a kind of like shady bar in a red light district right. like I was going to all sorts of places where I think if I'd like been scared of these places maybe when I had then encountered them people would have sensed the fear and then that would have caused a, you know much like danger. a new teacher in, in this in yeah this but whereas I was actively seeking these places out and then going and like sitting at the bar and like you know chatting to the person who was probably packing heat and on who knows what. Um, yeah, I think like sort of naive enthusiasm and a willingness to like really leave no stone unturned in my search for like real Latin America. Mm. Um, yeah. Well, Took me far. Yeah, well, it sounds like an amazing experience, an amazing series of experiences. And speaking of Mexico and rebellions, and that that brings us on to the main reason why I wanted to speak to you, which is about your book, Soldiers, Saints and Shamans, Indigenous Communities and the Revolutionary State in Mexico's Grand Naya, 1910 to 1940. So to begin with, could we have a little bit of context of this book? What was the story behind this? How did you get interested in this sort of topic in general? Um, I'm actually maybe to do with the Mexican Revolution. Just maybe caveat this whole um, part. Could be maybe for someone who is not aware. Could you explain, please, what the Mexican Re Mexican Revolution was? Please? So, Mexican Revolution um, 
kicks off in about 1910 with um, a kind of popular uprising against the aging dictator, Porfirio Diaz, who at this point had been in power um, for decades um, and was kind of like getting really old and had flirted with the idea of reintroducing a kind of democratic succession. And had then last minute decided that actually he wasn't going to do that. Um, and so all this kind of pent up popular enthusiasm about the idea of like a, tran a democratic transition instead is funneled into a mass uprising. Um, very quickly, he's forced to flee the country but that then kind of opens up um, the gates of factional infighting between the different kind of revolutionary factions, um, a military counter coup, and essentially um, following a very short and very successful um, rebellion against this dictator, um, you then get sort of nine years of pretty brutal civil war, um, which then settles down, um, a kind of a, a, a revolutionary state eventually emerges from this chaos. Um, and these kind of revolutionaries, basically the survivors of the, the civil war, um, the guys who kind of come out on top, um, who represent a kind of fairly kind of middle class, um, bourgeois kind of faction um, of like firm nationalists, um, but also kind of believers in modernity and progress. Um, try to create a new Mexico, um, which faces further kind of resistance and rebellion in rural areas um, and many indigenous areas. Finally, this faction kind of gives way to a more leftist faction in the mid-1930s, who, under the presidency of Lázaro Cárdenas, um, kind of successfully creates a strong state um, with quite strong kind of leftist currents, but also very strong nationalist kind of content, um, which then in 1940 um, gives way to the beginning of, of a kind of one party state system that endures um, all the way through to, well, yeah, to the end of the century and, and beyond. Um, so essentially, when we talk about the Mexican Revolution, there is the kind of the armed phase of the revolution, which is what a lot of people think of as, as the revolution. It's 10 years, civil war, lots of people in, in sombreros, holding rifles, um, riding on trains, Pancho Villa, Emiliano Zapata, um, kind of two of the famous figureheads of this era. Yeah. But then there's another kind of 20 years of revolutionary state building, um, of rural rebellions, religious conflict, um, until finally we can say that the revolutionary period is, is fully over. About 1940 gives way to the era of what Mario Vargas Llosa called the perfect dictatorship, which is this kind of like mix of it's kind of soft authoritarianism um, under a kind of one one party state system. Um, and my book basically looks at that entire history, um, those 30 years from 1910 through to 1940. Um, but through the kind of prism of life and politics, in a heavily indigenous region of Mexico in the northwest called El Gran Nayar, um, which kind of spans three different states, the state of Nayarit, where my family are from, um, the state of Durango, slightly to its north, and the state of Jalisco, um, to the east and south. And where those states meet um, in the middle of the Sierra Madre or Sedental Mountains, have a very like ethnically diverse, very rugged um, area. Yeah. 
called the Grand Nayar. It's home to four different indigenous peoples, the Kora or the Nayeri, um, the Wicholes, Wiraditari, um, the Tepehuanos or Otadam, and the Mexicaneros or Mexican peoples, um, who are themselves all divided between multiple different kind of communities, which are almost like kind of mini countries in themselves. It's a lot more kind of communal identity than there is kind of tribal identity. Um, but that said, there is also a real ethnic difference between each of these peoples and more importantly between these peoples and the rest of Mexico. So they speak their own languages, they practice their own not very Catholic at all religions. In the case of the Wiraritari, it's like they have their own specific temples um, as well as churches. These temples are where the kind of the old religion takes place. But actually what goes on in the churches is not particularly Catholic either in many ways. Um, you know, they have their own kind of traditional dress um, and, and their own very distinct kind of worldviews, cosmovisions, ways of life, ways of doing things, ways of living um, in a universe understood in very particular terms um, that are very much their own terms. Um, and so looking at this kind of big national event that is kind of really, really central to modern Mexican politics and even kind of like national identity, so much is about the revolution. Um, but looking at all of this stuff as it kind of affected and indeed was affected by these very distinct indigenous peoples mm. um, who were often viewed as kind of existing so far outside the Mexican mainstream that they couldn't have ever really had anything to do with this inherently national event. But they did, right. because the revolution touched every corner of Mexico and was the product of hundreds of different thousands, you know, of different communities, millions of different people's kind of actions and hopes and dreams and, you know, problems and all of that kind of feeds into what ends up being a national story. Um, but yeah, one of the, the main ideas that I set out to kind of explore was how do how do indigenous peoples kind of take part in national revolutions? And often, like, why have national revolutions failed to win the support of indigenous people? You know, if these kind of leftist movements are all about releasing the poorest and most oppressed from misery and, and poverty and oppression, um, why in Latin America are indigenous peoples who are always kind of on the very bottom of the pile when it comes to like oppression and poverty, so often um, either suspicious of these revolutions or actively opposed to them, you know, often fighting against them. What is all that about? Um, my basic conclusion was that for all that these revolutions are kind of leftist, um, they are also kind of national revolutions and their ideas of what the nation is are often very very ethnocentrist if not downright racist you know the nation as conceived by most of these revolutionary movements in mexico in nicaragua um in, in peru like i mean all over the place um often tend to view the nation is inherently mestizo, you know, kind of a mixed race, Spanish speaking um, kind of thing rather than indigenous. And so indigenous people see these revolutions as yet another example of dominant kind of cultures trying to wipe them out. Um, often is exactly well, what is yeah, happening. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> And so specifically within your research, 
what involvement do the indigenous communities have in this period of fighting that's going on in the revolution from sort of 1910 onwards? How are they involved? If they're sort of what what is their part of the story? And were you particularly interested in this because you feel like, um, and I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but was there has their story been quite as you said neglected generally in terms of the the, the mainstream kind of narrative historically of the Mexican Revolution? Would you say? Yeah, completely. Um... There's been quite a lot of work done on the kind of colonial era history of the Gran Nayar. Um, above all, because it was the last bit of Mexico to be kind of conquered um, by the Spanish 200 years after um, the fall of the Aztec capital. Spanish forces finally managed to defeat the kind of independent indigenous army in this area um, and sort of force them to convert to Christianity and accept Spanish rule. So, you know, that period, because it's a really extreme history and it's this last readout of indigenous resistance in Mexico, um, has, yeah, you know, been paid some attention. Um, Similarly, there, there is a, a key period in the mid-19th century um, when, under the leadership of this kind of bandit chief turned kind of agrarian reformer and revolutionary called Manuel Losada, um, again, you know, the indigenous peoples of this area formed an army, um, took control of, of quite a large area um, and kind of ruled it as, as an autonomous kind of sort of semi-state really um, for about 10 years. Um, yeah, so there's been some attention paid to that kind of era. Again, because it was a pretty extreme story of like indigenous resistance and um, then you kind of come to the revolutionary period um, and yeah they're just there's very little that's been written about that mm. although there's been quite a lot of um, ethnological anthropological kind of work done on these communities um, in the late 19th century in the early 20th century and then all the way through the kind of like from the 1930s through till now Lots of outsiders, Mexican and foreign, have, have, have gone to these places and talked to local people and tried to understand their languages and religions and rituals and ways of life. Um, and in some of those kind of works, um, there are references to what these communities did during the revolutionary period. But yeah, my book is the first kind of systematic history of like this entire area during this entire kind of 30 year period of like the revolution. Um, so yeah, it was quite a nice sort of historiographical niche um, to fill, uh, which yeah, I'm, I'm nearly there with uh, translating the, the thing into Spanish. Um, and yeah, hopefully it will be published in, in a Spanish version, Spanish language version in Mexico um, within the next year or two, because really the idea is to, yeah, I mean, it's all very well having it in English, but like I want the people who told me all of their stories to then see the kind of the end product. Um, and yeah, so that they can then use what I've written down in whatever way they might want to use it as a, resource as a document as a kind of like yeah you know Absolutely. and what was your process in researching this topic what did you do to to go about investigating this area uh well i mean i'm a historian by training so i spent a lot of time in the archives in mexico city in uh, the state capitals of the kind of states that the Gran Nayar forms part of. Um, and yeah, sort of municipal archives, church archives, 
trying to find any kind of written information on anything to do with any of these communities mm. um, during this entire period. Um, and yeah, the flip side of that was I went to as many of the communities of the Gran Nayar as I could. I must have been to about sort of 20 or so different kind of villages um, of the maybe like 30 that, yeah, so I mean, maybe got to about two thirds. Um, and yeah, um, a lot of the time I would get there and just hang out, <laughs> um, talk to people, but I wouldn't even attempt to do any sort of like actual work. I'd just, yeah, first thing you have to do is you have to go and see the traditional authorities, it's like basically the kind of council of elders, um, and say, hi, you know. I'm so and so. I come from so and so. You know, I'm here because I'd like to learn more about the revolution. Like the idea is to, like, you know, this is going to be for my PhD, um, and then I'd like to make it into a book. Um, but you guys are the authorities, so you can tell me what the rules are. And similarly, you know, I'm not going to do any work right now. I need to get to know the place right. first um, but do you give me your permission to at least kind of like hang about for a bit and often they'd yeah typically they'd be a bit suspicious at first but they would agree that it was fine if I just kind of hung around for a bit and then the next trip um, I would see them again and um, talk a bit more and you know there was a kind of whole process of like gaining people's trust right um, that went on before I could actually expect to get any like real kind of material I guess um, so yeah I also like just getting kind of historical information wasn't really enough I increasingly learned that just by being there that people's ways of thinking and reasons for doing stuff were like really heavily informed by their cultures. Do you have an example of that that you could share where that sort of became evident to you? Um, well, yeah, I mean, like, just, I think, you know, the most important thing um, that I found was that um, People really strongly believe still and believed even more strongly in the kind of 1920s and 30s um, that their religious practices are kind of what keeps the entire universe existing. In fact, they ritually recreate the universe and everything within it and all of history um, every time they carry out a particular kind of, of ritual a couple of times a year if they stop doing that not only would things cease to exist but the interconnected way that their history works which is very different to ours history and the universe would never have existed in the first place Right. <laughs> without without continually recreating the universe through ritual, the universe wow. would never have existed in the first place. Because everything that you do now is also everything that has happened. And things that have happened are also present in now, but it's like there's a kind of bi-directional way of seeing things. Um, and so... It's not that like people were proud of their culture so much as like people understood their culture as essential to all existence. Mm. And so any threat to their culture is a potentially kind of apocalyptic wow. thing, which meant that, um, yeah, efforts to kind of educate um, these indigenous people out of their kind of 
primitive beliefs and superstitions um, on the behalf of, you know, in order to like, you know, get them on the march towards like progress and modernity um, was seen as a real like life or death kind of threat. Um, but I, in order to really understand that, I needed to like understand a lot more about what these rituals were and what religious belief kind of consists of and how belief and practice and all of this stuff kind of works and how it all works together. And um, yeah, religion there is like really intertwined with um, certain forms of subsistence agriculture. So by being like a kind of small subsistence farmer, you are carrying out a religious duty. Mm. Um, and so like I, I needed to hang out with these farmers and I needed to like try to go to as many of their different rituals as I could and generally like immerse myself as far as was possible and I've only scratched the, the surface. Um, but yeah, I needed to like kind of get to know at least a bit of all of this like very different cultural stuff in order to like even start to understand why people had done the things that they had done, you know, 70, 80, 90 years ago. And what sort of, um, did you see many religi uh, religious rituals and performed at all? Or was there anything that you were sort of deliberately, you had to be kept away from that they weren't comfortable with you seeing? Or? Oh, I mean, like, if they weren't comfortable with me being there, they wouldn't invite me to attend. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I went to a load of, uh, every different community has different practices and some of them are, have lots of things in common and others are much more like distinct um so yeah i mean like i've been to loads of different kind of fiestas and celebrations and like certain mitotes which are these kind of like world creating things um but there was always a lot more that i wasn't going to just because there's stuff happening all over the place um all of the time and um yeah, you know, often things are done on a kind of like family level or kind of clan basis. And often the like sacred place where a particular kind of clan group carry out their version of a particular ritual is like 10 hours walk away. Like, and, you know, there were only so many times I could go and go on a like, long walk to get somewhere mm. um so yeah um yeah i as i say like i've i've only scratched the surface if i was a, a an anthropologist an ethnologist kind of living in one of these communities for years on end um i would have been able to drill down i think much further into um you know, everything um as it was i was trying to visit as many of these communities as possible. Um, so I guess I got quite like broad kind of view of things, mm. um, but that's a view that inherently lacks like really in-depth specific um, kind of knowledge. Um, yeah, the most concerted thing I did was I spent, I kind of, yeah, one way or another, I signed up to uh, taking part in the Easter celebrations of, of one particular community every year for five years so in a row, just kind of like a ritual commitment that you make to kind of serve a five-year term um, as part of, of Semana Santa, what they call like, yeah, the, the Holy Week celebrations, um, which, yeah, a lot of hard work, but good fun and very eye-opening. In what way? Um, I just, you know, there's a lot of like ritual stuff that goes on during this period that I got to be part of because I was kind of part of um, the team of 
people who were involved with that stuff. Um, yeah, a lot of it was going on in the, the Nayeri language, which I speak a few words of. So, you know, most of it went over my head, but you at least like get a little bit of a sense of like some of what is happening. Um, but yeah, but you know, it's, it's an area like that's it's about the size of Wales, the Grand Nayar. Um, and there are very few paved roads. There's some really significant mountains and some really significant canyons. Um, so it's a pretty hard place to get around unless you're up for some really long walks. And I'm up for some long walks, but um, you know, there's only kind of so many of those you can do. Um, that was also there like right bang in the middle of some of the worst outbreaks of violence um, in recent years, which also slightly limited my ability to like go wherever I wanted because, yeah, you know, quite a lot of like armed people roaming around um, who you wouldn't necessarily want to like run into. Um, again, somehow managed to avoid any like unpleasant experiences for the most part like wasn't kidnapped or threatened with violence in any meaningful way every now and again a drunk person waves a gun but you get used to that um but no one no one shot at me um, <laughs> but there were some places where you know local people would be like you shouldn't go to that community right now they're in the middle of like a really serious conflict uh, so you know you wouldn't go to that to that community um, and there were a couple of those kind of places that were really like going through kind of convulsions of violence um, like feuds between families or being attacked by a kind of armed group or whatever um, that just didn't let you know that stuff didn't let up enough while I was kind of really engaged in my field work to like ever quite have a chance to to go and hang out there so yeah you know um it's a it's a difficult place to work uh the grand layer um but yeah i think a very interesting place to work it sounds um, fascinating yeah, I mean, what's Mexico's government involved when they if there are conflicts going on between communities? Do, do Mexico's government get involved at all, or do they? Well, they've normally been involved by they, often they've kind of seeded the conflict in the first place by. Right. Um, yeah, you know, there's there's a lot of deep politics, but um, conflicts over land are often not so much conflicts. over like the land per se, but conflicts over where the government has kind of gone in and intervened and said, right, the, la the, the line is here. Mm. And then a community has seen that as favouring the other community. And, and there's kind of no, there used to be ritual ways, ritualised kind of like ways of working out land disputes through the kind of mediation of elders and a load of like ceremonial stuff, um, which once a government body comes in and like draws some lines on a map and then gives people a copy of the map and it's like, this is now reality. <laughs> Those kind of traditional mechanisms of conflict revolution, re resolution go out the window. Um, and potentially what then happens is you've kind of seeded a much more modern kind of territorial conflict um, yeah. about lines on a map that, that you can't really solve in a way that like satisfies everyone. Mm. Which then often creates a really long-running conflict. Similarly, um, the simple act of um, overseeing a kind of like system of, of prohibition when it comes to drugs. Um, the, the Gran Nayar is a major or was a major opium growing zone um, because opium is illegal, therefore there is a black market for it, therefore it's worth quite a lot of money and it's one of the only things that is worth quite a lot of money that you can also produce in the Gran Nayar, so people do that because it's one of the only ways of earning any cash. Mm. Um, 
But the fact that it's illegal creates a load of risks and seeds a load of conflicts. You know, you have the army and police forces kind of parachuting in um, or jumping out of helicopters and like burning people's fields. You know, that causes conflict with those people who had that field. They also, once you've got certain people feeling like they're getting victimized, that often then creates further conflicts down, down the road. Um, and competition for resources like water needed to grow opium poppies, you know, also creates conflict. You have people fighting over control of certain kind of water sources for their irrigation systems. Um, you know, this wasn't a problem 50 years ago necessarily when like, um, nobody really needed that spring for anything other than drinking water but now you've got a whole irrigation system of hoses and stuff tied into it these kind of resources have become yeah objects of like kind of competition in a way that they, they just didn't used to be and when did this first start to emerge this sort of element of uh, the violence and that kind of thing with the black market. When did it, when did we first sort of see that emerge in this region? Uh, well, the sort of the illegal opium trade in Mexico goes all the way back to the 1920s um, in areas not far from the Gran Nayar. But really, um, it's, I guess, it's very hard to say with certainty, but it's at some point in the kind of late 70s or early 1980s. Um, that opium starts to be produced at, at any kind of scale in the Gran Nayar. Um, marijuana too. Um, the market has dropped out, you know, the, the bottom of, of, of the market has kind of dropped out um, for marijuana. So, yeah, I guess weed growing kind of dried up at some point in the early 2000s. Um, but opium until 2018 um, remained big business mm. for small farmers. Um, since then, the rise of synthetic drugs like fentanyl have also caused a market crisis for opium. And so, yeah, um, that's massively kind of shaken up the economy in the Gran Nayar now. And um, yeah, hard to know exactly what is going to happen. Um, but a lot of people have fought, you know, the, the coercive forces of the state, endured the attacks of cartels, um, and kind of like survived all sorts of beefs with their neighbours um, since the 80s in order to like produce opium. And it's taken this basically kind of economic crash, the massive reduction in the demand for opium to produce heroin because you can make sort of synthetic heroin-like drugs with precursor chemicals from Asia now, um, has, yeah, basically like in the space of a couple of years, like dried up this entire kind of illicit economy um, in a way that you know, no law has been able to, um, yeah, shows you the power of the market hmm. um, for these things. Um, well, would you mind, do you mention that it, it, you can trace it back to the 1920s of opium production? Mm. Have you done much sort of research on that field and could you maybe explain a bit about the origins of opium production in, in this period? How does this sort of come about? So yeah, so um, I guess another subfield of mine as a historian uh, these days is the history of the Mexican drug trade in particular um, and the history of Mexican opium in particular. Um, so yeah, I'm not, I'm not the expert in this. Um, my mate Benjamin Smith probably knows a lot more than I do. Um, but essentially the late 19th, early 20th century, um, there were a few members of the kind of Mexican Chinese community growing a little bit of opium for personal consumption or to basically kind of sell to their mates. Um, as the rules tightened up in the States and indeed there were kind of pogroms of 
um, Chinese Americans, um, Chinese Mexicans, including people who've been displaced from the states, kind of have been forced to, people of Chinese origin, um, been kind of forced to to cross the border south. Um, also started growing some opium for um, the US market. Um, in the 1920s, some Mexicans learn about this illicit crop from Chinese neighbors um, and potentially start growing a little bit for themselves, mainly in Sinaloa and Sonora. Um, this is kind of tolerated by the local authorities and up in, in Baja California, um, where the kind of the, the San Diego Tijuana border crossing is, the state governor at this point, um, Esteban Cantu, um, knows all about an illicit trade in, in opium that's going on um, to sort of supply a black market in LA um, and actually ta you know, officially kind of taxes it and yeah. uses these kind of drug trade profits um, to prop up his regime and build a whole load of like roads and schools. Um, into the 1930s, um, in the midst of periods of kind of violent ethnic cleansing, basically in, in Sinaloa and Sonora, where um, members of the kind of Chinese community are chased out of their homes. Um, yeah, outbreaks of racist violence. Um, what had until then been a mainly kind of Chinese Mexican operation um, passes into the hands of ethnic Mexicans um, who see the potential for more money to be made by sort of producing more and selling more um, with an eye on the kind of US market. And so the, sort of this trade in opium expands geographically, it involves more and more people. Um, and inevitably more and more kind of kickbacks go to local authorities too. Um, and then things really kick off during World War II, where the disruption caused by global war basically dries up previous kind of um, drug trafficking routes from Asia and from Europe that had kind of supplied the US um, with, with opiates. Um, at which point Mexico becomes a massive player in the, the kind of the American drug trade, um, using a lot of the same smuggling routes that during Prohibition had been used for illicit smuggling of alcohol across the border. Suddenly it's illicit smuggling of, of opium and increasingly heroin um, that is like refined in Mexico in labs um, run by yeah, enterprising chemists and pharmacists. Um, and yeah, as more and more people in the States use opiates, more and more people in Mexico grow opium to supply drug trafficking networks to turn the opium into heroin and then smuggle it north. Um, in 1972, so-called French connection that had linked kind of Turkish opium producers to French chemists via the Corsican mafia, then transported it all yeah. to New York. Um, it's broken apart by kind of multiple busts um, in Turkey, in France, and in the US. And again, you know, the Mexican suppliers step into the void um, and yeah, grow quite wealthy through through heroin smuggling. Um, yeah, I mean, not that much has really changed no, since well, then. It sounds like very similar to the sort of current situation that's kind of going on, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the roots of, of 
the opium trade now are in this period of kind of expansion um, in the kind of 70s. Um, and it's the tail end, I guess, of that, sort of the early 80s when um, this kind of new illicit economy arrives and really establishes itself in, in the areas of the Granayat where I've been doing field work. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's a lot more of, of Mexico than just the Gran Nayar. It's kind of tied up in all of this stuff. Um, so in the south, you have the state of Guerrero, um, which is also very poor, quite heavily indigenous, um, mountainous area, which is, yeah, famous nowadays for drug violence and being the place where the 43 students of Ayotzinapa were disappeared by local police working for a cartel, a case that's become quite well known internationally. Um, but yeah, all of that stuff is tied up with, with opium. Um, similarly, the kind of the Golden Triangle where El Chapo Guzman comes from, where season one of Narcos Mexico um, spends quite a lot of time on, you know, that's it's opium country. So yeah, but so where did your interest in specifically opium come from, though? What, what? It was just literally from being in the Gran Nayar right. and talking, you know, and people would quite openly talk about you know, the harvest, um, and it was kind of farmers talk about their crops, and mm. these crops happen to be illicit. But um, you know, my my friends. Um, were very open to talking to me all about the ins and outs of like being on the bottom rung of this kind of global drug trade. Mm -hmm. um, and it was really interesting, I guess, not just because I kind of accidentally gained access to this world just by kind of hanging out, um, but also because the kind of contrast between these kind of indigenous kind of peasant producers um, who remain really poor and faced all sorts of like really quite like harsh violence and, and danger and whatever um, for very little gain mainly in order to like sustain the lifestyle of like peasant production that is viewed as I said earlier like as almost kind of like a religious obligation you know? um, but the, the fact that all of this kind of stuff this like real like country stuff um, was sustaining and was completely essential to this like world of like massive profits and kind of glitz and you know I'd always kind of understood the, the drug trade as like being all about cartels big cities, um, and, you know, like really powerful, like individuals at the top of kind of transnational empires, corrupting entire governments. But the reality of, of this drug trade that I was suddenly seeing was these like kind of semi-independent, like really poor indigenous communities who were just like trying to get by. Um, and that kind of contrast was, was really interesting. Yeah, and so how do they how do they actually get involved in the drug? So are they just approached by cartels? Like, as in, what's the like? How does it actually work? I mean, it all sense? it all started off with just a few people who were like, one way or another, were kind of came into contact with people who knew about opium and marijuana. Were often given some seeds. And, you know, somebody, in a few cases, it was teachers who'd been working in, in areas where the drug trade was already, already well established, who were transferred to these indigenous communities where people hadn't really heard of, of opium. Um, and these, these teachers were like, hey, you know, you want to grow something that's going to earn you some cash? Try these. Um, if you grow them, um, I will pay you x amount of money for like you know per gram of, of of the stuff that you you know i'll show you how to do it um and it only takes one successful season 
for an entire community to see that this this guy's made a load of money doing this quite simple thing. Suddenly everyone does it. Um, and then the next year, the next village along are also doing it. Um, and you get a kind of mini boom. Then the army kind of twig that people are doing it and will come in and tax some producers, burn other producers' fields, um, and generally kind of like, yeah, go in all guns blazing. Some people will be like, okay, no, that's enough for me. I'm not going to get any more involved in this. Other people are like, this is too good to give up, so I'm going to stick with this. Um, and then, you know, before you know it, kind of like one generation have been doing this for long enough that their kids are like, well, what else are we going to do? Um, kind of within the space of 10 years, what was a very novel crop has almost become a traditional way of life. Wow. Um, yeah. And do you see the indigenous communities, the, the farmers, do they get mixed up in the violence that much at all? Is that as prominent for them as well? Uh, yeah. I mean, like, they're mainly on the receiving end, uh, unfortunately. Mm. Um, but yeah, particularly if there's, if, there are fight, if there's fighting between different kind of organised crime groups, cartels, whatever, um, over territory, then you know one group may come in and be like, "If you sell anything or have anything to do with this other group, you know we'll kill you." Then the other group come in and say, "If you have anything to do with those guys, we'll kill you." You get caught in the middle, and often one group or the other group will carry out their threat. You know. Mm. Um, similarly. Um, just the proliferation of, of guns in these communities and the increased kind of drinking that comes with a sudden kind of windfall of, of cash um, leads to people drunkenly shooting at each other, um, which can then kind of seed further conflict. So, yeah, I think that the drug trade and the profits and the lifestyle that have kind of come with it has also increased, like, yeah, all sorts of unfortunate social trends, you know, interpersonal violence of all sorts, um, particular kind of forms of gendered violence as well, um, have become more prevalent, and things that already existed have become more deadly because rather than drunks punching each other, you know, everyone pulls out a gun. And that mm. Obviously has a much higher fatality rate. Yeah, and uh, why have things become so much worse in the last sort of, is it, am I correct in saying the last sort of few years we've seen things become much worse, or is it, is that not right? Uh, basically, the, the kind of current violence, the violence in its current form dates back to 2006, um, when the fairly new president, who had only just, um, kind of won out over accusations um, and mass protests over um, kind of a stolen election, if you will. Um, yeah, so you have a president, he wins, but it's a disputed election. He's won by like a fraction of 1%. There are accusations of cheating, of fraud, of all sorts of other things, mass protests, in part in order to kind of cement his position as the new president, he declares an all-out war on the drug cartels, um, sends the army onto the streets in all sorts of different kind of bits of Mexico, um, and very quickly the bodies start to pile up. Um, at first, the assumption is that the bodies piling up are all members of these kind of criminal gangs and cartels and whatever. Um, but quickly it becomes impossible to kind of sustain this idea that the only people dying are somehow kind of guilty. Um, because essentially, like, you send the army onto the streets to do police work and they use army tactics to, like, do that police work, which involves lots of innocent bystanders getting killed, 
the wrong person getting accused of something and being killed. Um, similarly, the increased pressure on these criminal organisations from the state resulted in increased conflict between them. Mm. Um, and more recently, accusations that kind of corruption and favouritism were built into the DNA of this military operation um, have been kind of confirmed by the the trial of um, General Garcia Luna, who was kind of one of the architects of this like war on the cartels, drug czar and right hand man of, of President Calderon, um, who's just been found guilty in a US court um, of active drug smuggling with the Sinaloa cartel. Um, and basically the story is that the war on drugs in Mexico was never a war on drugs in Mexico. It was a war on one cartel on behalf of another cartel. Um, which ended pretty well for the Sinaloa cartel, um, who gave hundreds of millions of dollars in bribes to Garcia Luna, potentially other very high-ranking members of the government and the armed forces. Um, and yeah, you know, that kind of like paves the way for the complete institutionalization of like a new higher level of like narco corruption in society of like all against all warfare on the streets. Um, and yeah, despite the new president being the guy who lost in that disputed election and led those protests coming to power um, four years ago now, swearing that he was going to like undo the damage done by this guy who had kind of like stolen the election from him and started all this chaos in the first place. Um, yeah, President um, AMLO, as he's known, Andres Manuel López Obrador has not demilitarized um, the kind of conflict. And so it remains kind of as bad as ever. The violence mm -hmm. has kind of plateaued a bit, but like it's already at such a high level that the fact that it's not rising doesn't mean it's not really bad. Right. And in terms of from your own personal experiences, how much kind of corruption, I suppose, were you have, have been exposed to in terms of, or, or in terms of stories that you've heard from speaking to people in those communities? Uh, I mean, when it comes to like the drug trade, I guess it's as simple as um, the army is not expected to destroy 100% of poppy plantations, because that would be impossible. So the target is, say, destroying 30% of all opium plantations. So that means the army basically can go into an area where there is drug production and say, right, we're going to destroy 30% of all of your stuff, which means that you get to keep 70%. Who ends up in that unlucky 30%? is up to you mm -hmm. um so and you basically you, you create a little nice little auction you know an unofficial taxation system and some communities will will all club together and like pay off the army to kind of leave as much stuff alone as possible other communities, it'll be like certain people in that community have a deal going on with like some of the army people and others don't. And it's the people that don't that get hit worse. I mean, you know, that's that's just inbuilt into this kind of like militarized forcible eradication scenario. Like you're never going to get everything, which means that the army knows it doesn't have to try, which means that the army can charge for trying even less hard or for trying selectively. But so in terms of all of this, the, the drug trade, particularly in Mexico, I feel like usually the narrative is only, it's focused specifically just on the cartels within Mexico themselves and Latin America. What I mean is we kind of forget am amongst all this that the biggest consumer, as far as I'm aware, you know, is America and the mm. US. And I feel like it's that by focusing just on the cartels themselves within Latin America, you're only focusing on sort of like half of the story. And I was wondering what your thoughts are on that, on how this everything that's kind of going on right now is portrayed in the mainstream media. And if there are any kind of big misconceptions, you think, about the drug trade and what's going on right now? Well, 
Um, <laughs> where to start? I mm. mean, popular ideas of the drug trade tend to be kind of warped out of all real recognition. Um, but I think, well, one, it's really important to note that um, not only is the US the largest kind of consumer of, of drugs in the world, it's the largest market for drugs in the world, um, it's also the largest exporter of guns to Latin America. Um, the vast majority of the murders that happen as part of this kind of like drug war that is ongoing in Mexico are carried out with American arms in order to get Mexican products or Colombian products that are shipped through Mexico to American consumers. So like, it's almost like the, the worst of the violence of the American drug trade is just kind of exported to Mexico. Um, which is obviously like not particularly fair, mm. um, but it also means that um, I think there are certain stereotypes that have been actively encouraged by irresponsible p politicians like Donald Trump, but also a range of other people who were less easy to kind of like point at and you know accuse, and are less like maybe like blatant in 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 doing it but um yeah there's a lot of like kind of bad ombre narrative around you know oh uh, well you know latin americans are kind of inherently violent um and that's the main reason why the violence is so bad um oh yeah well you know like down south of course they're all killing each other and um that's just kind of the way they are Yeah, those sorts of like deeply problematic and just completely like racist ideas are unfortunately like at the center of a lot of um, the narratives about how the drug trade works, why it works as it does, why societies in Latin America are violent. Um, and I think that, you know, the, the work that I've done um, on on kind of peasant opium production in Mexico um, and this kind of crisis within that world um, at the moment is quite instructive um, because you've seen, you know, I've seen directly how a reduction in demand um, for opium has effectively ended opium production mm. in an area of Mexico that's, that's kind of the size of Wales almost overnight, suddenly no one's, no one's paying the old price for opium. They're offering you like peanuts. So everyone's like, well, it's not profitable anymore. Why are we gonna like risk our lives to do this like thing mm. that's no longer worth it? And so suddenly like they're out. Which means that like, 30 years of concerted, violent um, crackdowns on the drug trade have been completely ineffective. And a single kind of big shift in like the market dynamics has, has, has been really effective. I think that that suggests um, that current approaches to drug control, approaches that depend on prohibition are not just like pointless and useless, they are actually dangerous and they are directly leading to like increased violence of all kinds. And the solution has to be a market-based solution. You can't just like, you can't ban something that is, is coveted mm. and expect um, the market to not kind of respond to that. So you have to find a way of, if drugs are bad, you know, okay, fair enough. Like we can argue that point well, later, bad. but yeah. you know, alcohol, tobacco, like mm. there are all sorts of things that are bad um, that don't have incredibly violent, like brutal um, and incredibly profitable trades attached. You know, like the dr drug trade for people at the top levels, it's like, you know, incredibly profitable as well like way more profitable than like 
the beer trade is. So it's like all money and all violence when it could be something like the beer trade, which is it's making people money, but like it's not kind of corrupting entire governments with the amount of money that is available from it. Um, and yeah, people are getting pissed off and punching each other at closing time and drink driving and drinking themselves into an early grave. But like there is sufficient regulation of alcohol consumption that it's not causing a kind of public health crisis on the level right now of the opioid crisis in the US. Opioids have become the main cause of death in men below the age of 50 in the US. It's overtaken suicide, it's overtaken car crashes, um, and it dwarfs drinking. Um, so clearly, the, you know, the war on drugs, it's not stopping Americans killing themselves with no. drugs. It's not stopping um, Mexicans killing each other to get those drugs to the States. Um, and it's not stopping you know, organized criminal enterprises like buying out entire kind of governments um, in order to continue to do that. So, Well, absolutely. And not to, to open this can of worms, because then this is a whole other topic. But then from there, you'd go on to then the privatization of prisons and how they've been able to, you know, in America, you, particularly you can just fill up their cells with the kid who's been caught with weed or, or whatever, whatever drug it, it may be. And, you know, it gets you wondering, you know, with privatization of how much money there is in these things, why certain things may or may not be the case. Um, what, just quickly, what is your sort of, this is quite a big question, what's your sort of prediction of where this may go, particularly maybe in, in Mexico? What do you think is going to happen? Where do you think this is going? Do you think it's just going to get even worse? Or what, what do you think? Um, I think there are, there are reasons to be cautiously optimistic. Um, the fact that homicide rates have kind of plateaued at a high level, yes, but for the first time in years, they're not getting even higher, for the moment at least. I think that's a good thing. Similarly, um, there are in both the US and in Mexico kind of legal moves to start like regulating, decriminalizing, and even fully legalizing um, certain drugs in the states this is going on at state level there's been no federal moves in this direction yet um, but typically from what I know um, as a historian the world of drug policy in the US starts you know reform starts at state level and it reaches a point when where the federal government can no longer kind of ignore it and keep stone, stonewalling it and they have to write it into some kind of federal law. This has happened with the moves towards ever increasing repression of the drug trade. Um, the most repressive anti-drug policies all began at state level. They were often bipartisan initiatives involving Democrats and Republicans, um, working kind of in response to public outcries, panics, media, sensational kind of storms, about particular drugs, about particular communities who were implicated in like spreading drugs to yeah. nice white people. Yeah. And I think the same thing could happen, but in reverse. You know, at state level, people are seeing the damage that the war on drugs is doing to their communities. Middle class people are, are and, you know, middle class white people are finally kind of suffering the consequences of the war on drugs in terms of like, their loved ones, their kids are dying, um, not because they're killing each other, but because they're killing themselves. And, you know, support is building amongst people who, who think drugs are bad, but they think the war on drugs is worse mm. um, for legalization or at least regulation of drugs in order to like change the kind of paradigm and increase the opportunities for new treatment regimes. Um, so, you know, I think that within the next decade, um, there is gonna be some kind of like federal level reform of, of drug laws in the US that is gonna reduce, you know, the, the sheer kind of death count. Um, and I really hope that um, that has a positive impact on things in Mexico. And also that reforms in Mexico 
are pushed forward. Um, there are there's a kind of legalization initiative ongoing um, with regards to marijuana um, that's been taken even further in particular states. There have been a couple of indigenous communities that have been given licenses to grow medicinal marijuana. Um, and I think that, you know, that's a sign that things are maybe heading in the right direction. There are murmurings about the same kind of thing being applied in certain areas, maybe potentially to opium, um, because opium is the raw material for morphine and heroin, which are two of the most vital drugs to any kind of system of healthcare, especially as cancer um, affects ever more people as populations age, more of that population is liable to get cancer. End of life care for cancer patients involves heroin. Right. Um, so the demand for, for these drugs for licit purposes is actually kind of going up um, even as like demand for, for heroin amongst like, you know, drug users in the States kind of declines because of the increasing prevalence of synthetic opiates. So yeah, I think there is, there is room to hope, mm. um, you know, it's that pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will, you know, like I'm, I'm with Gramsci on this one, like my thinking brain acknowledges that things are pretty bad and worrying and there's a lot to reason to be worried about but like I strive to be optimistic mm. and um, yeah to maintain a kind of like long-term hope that things will get better which as a historian like yeah you know things move slowly yeah um, absolutely. but hopefully we're coming out of a, a kind of a really dark time and we're heading for a better time, you know. Absolutely, and I think that, that brings us round to, to where we started of the importance of understanding the kind of nuance in all these sort of situations um, and understanding hi the history of them and how we sort of got in these places in the first place. That's how I believe history can help us to, to change the future by understanding how we got there in the first place. I think that's what we've, uh, you've hopefully demonstrated today is just for understanding the past, that's how we can improve things rather. But yeah, uh, the links to uh, Dr. Nathaniel Morris's work is going to be in the description, so please check it out because it's really fascinating stuff. But um, now to begin to conclude, so what was your biggest fear when you were younger? Oh, I mean, I was, um, I was really freaked out by uh, the electrified line on the tube. Um, you know, talking about like actual fear mm. of a thing. Um, yeah, live wires and electricity in general. I was always scared of like somehow falling on the tracks um, on the tube and frying myself. Um, I can remember having nightmares about like suddenly like being in a tunnel and stepping on the wrong rail. Um, you know, weird, visceral kid shit. Interesting. What's your biggest fear today? Um, I mean, in amongst all of the like, you know, climate change mm. um, and sort of decline and fall of civilization, <laughs> um, the idea that the Tories might win another election or that Labour finally win an election and then do absolutely nothing to change society. Um, but, you know, I think. Um, yeah, I'm trying to worry less about UK politics and I'm trying to be a little bit more sanguine about like climate change, which is so big that there's very little that I can actively do to stop it. Um, but one thing, yeah, one, one real fear that I have, um, is that in, in the midst of all of these kind of like crises, um, we forget that um, half of all languages are endangered and um, you know, a language pretty much goes extinct every day and we are heading towards a world in which even if humanity survives the various self-imposed environmental crises that we've created, we will be such an incredibly homogenized humanity um, that we've deprived ourselves of the kind of like 
ability to like see beyond one very kind of like enclosed culture mm. and language. Um, and the next set of problems we won't be able to think our way out of because we've like basically whittled down our ways of seeing and understanding the world into just like one homogenous way. Um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm terrified that um, the world that I've been born into, a world of like cultural and linguistic diversity that really means something like important. This is not just superficial diversity of like people with different skin color who will think exactly the same way. I'm talking about like the existence of indigenous peoples, for example, who have a different way of understanding the world and of their place within it compared to me. You know, yeah, I worry that that by the time I leave this planet, um, most of, of them will have gone and, you know, the their kids or, or grandkids or the great grandkids of, of the um, people that I've spent all this time with in indigenous communities in Mexico, um, you know, learning amazing things about these really distinct ideas that they have about stuff, um, you know, they will have lost all of that and will just have been kind of reprogrammed to be exactly like everyone in bloody London. Hmm. Well, it's definitely food for thought. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is one piece of advice you'd give your younger self? Um, ooh, I don't know. I mean, does it need to be advice that... Can I just reinforce? <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, I mean, go travel see the world, you know, it can be and, anything. and, and the rest will follow. I mean, like would be the advice um, I'd give to my younger self, but I, I already knew I was going to do that and I did it. So, um, yeah, I don't know, maybe like, maybe I should choose some advice that I wish I'd had and followed. Um, yeah, I don't know. Well, what advice would you give to young people today? Go see the world, travel, right. um, learn from the other, um, and you will almost inevitably, almost certainly learn way more about yourself than you think you will. You're not going to come away with amazing insights about like how another culture works compared to the stuff that you learn about how your own culture works, but that is incredibly valuable. Um, and yeah, man, of, you know, my, my students at the moment, so many of them have not gone on gap years. Mm. Um, so many people go straight from like primary school to secondary school to university and then into a job. And yeah, like people travel more now than they've ever traveled before because of like low cost airlines and whatever else. But like going on holiday is, is not the same as like going and experiencing different realities going you know go and put yourself in danger somewhere without knowing it go and like take some risks go and like be dumb and you will learn so much more from that than you might sitting in a classroom you know with a load of peers who similarly don't have any real life experiences very different to your own Again, it's that homogenization of experience um, that worries me. So if you're listening, go and get out there, please. What are you waiting for? Um, <laughs> on that note, Dr. Nathaniel Morris, thank you very much. My absolute pleasure. Mm -hmm.